going to do the introductory presentation as quickly as possible so that everyone can ask questions. Okay, so uh, we are going to start with Dr. Nuzha Shakroni. Nuzha, I'm going to just say a couple of words. Uh, you have taught in France. You have uh, also taught in the United States and Morocco. You have witnessed systemic inequities and became a union leader to fight them. Then you pivoted to national stage as member of parliament in the Social Democratic Party, and later as a minister, as well as a diplomat for eight years in Canada before going to Harvard University. Can you share with us your unique experience in addressing disabilities uh, as a minister, but also um, in uh, later positions? And, they, and I'm sure there will be many questions. Rizha, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alain. Hello uh, to all. Uh, I'm delighted to be here and uh, to share with you my experience as the first minister in charge of women issues, social protection, people with disabilities, issues that were not a high priority in the past. Our new vision was first to reframe the issue, namely, is it, it is society which is handicapped, not people with disabilities. Secondly, to pivot from humanitarian charity, from humanitarian charity approach, to consider the issue of fundamental human rights, starting with equal education and integration of children with disabilities. Next, to bring, bring the ministers of health and of justice to align their policies and regulations with our mission. Operationally, we mobilize specialized educators and appropriate equipment, accessibilities like ramps for the physically disabled and provide wheelchairs to those in need, braille for the blind, and especially sound libraries and sign language for the deaf mutes. Communication wise was embarked on changing perception and we leverage the forces of civil society given its proximity to families and actors and other stakeholders. In retrospect, I am now proud that within 10 years, young children have completed their primary and high school studies and went to universities and workplace that would something that would have been impossible in the past. Thank you, and I keep to your proposal. Thank you so much, Nuzha. Um, we are going to move with our next person, would be Rachel. And uh, Rachel, you have an outstanding, uh, well, you suffered systemic ra racism from the beginning of your school life, yet you have an outstanding track record as a student in primary and secondary school. And in university, becoming a computer scientist now for 20 years. While counting to ser while uh, serving in your profession, you have also a mission to combat inequities by endowing children with skills like STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. You also worked as an activist, moving from Canada to Washington and uh, to help leaders like Baram, Barack Obama lead the nation. You are working with the victims of exclusion, like migrants, disinformation, and inequity. I just want to mention here, disinformation is more than misinformation. Disinformation is engineered. Misinformation can be accidental. And uh, you have worked in these fields, and you work in every day more than any of us. It's a great honor and privilege to listen to you, Rachel. Merci, thank you. Um, I want to talk about diversity in general and the youth, the youth. So one of the things to understand is that um, there are biases that permeate our society. And children as young as three years old have learned bias by osmosis. So they know what immutable traits are associated with beauty, intelligence, strength, trustworthiness, etc. Um, I also want to stress that children can 
learn or unlearn biases by their adult influencers um, who explicitly advance or hinder development uh, on the issue. So it has to be done explicitly. And there are many learning tools that can be used to influence children. So it's about books, about bias, books with uh, different protagonists that look uh, or a different culture than the reader, um, cultivating a wide, diverse social network, whether it's play dates, medical professionals, faith services, seeking toys that reflect the diversity in the world or the country that they live in, and travel. Travel is a great way to expose children to other communities. So um, just the last thing I want to say is that adults themselves, before this thing can work, adults themselves must get comfortable with the idea of diversity um, before they can be successful in teaching it to others or to their children. So that, that's my intervention. Merci beaucoup, Rachel. And I'm sure there will be many questions. Uh, next is uh, Professor uh, Vincent de Louise. Uh, Vincent, um, you are a professor with a diversified background as professor of ophthalmology, as a member of the American College of Surgeons, as a musician who plays clarinet in a symphony, orchestra, fine arts critique, and you were also uh, voted the best doctor of America. You migrated or pivoted during the last few years to teach medical humanities in education to ophthalmologists and other medical students. What are, from your perspective, the antidotes to inclusion, to exclusion, inequities, and disinformation? Thank you so much, Alain. If you could bring up my few slides that will represent my initial three minute talk, and then I have more to talk about when we go to the debate and discussion section. So I'm gonna focus on empathy and compassion as I know that others of you will as well. Uh, and so uh, both empathy and compassion have their roots in the Greek pathos. Can you, which can you, means, see, can you see the screen? The can you see the screen? And you can hear yes. me okay. Okay. We terrific. hear you very well, and I think we have your your photos. Your slides. So both empathy and compassion have their roots uh, in the Greek pathos, which means suffering, through the Latin, through a component verb, interesting, a, a verb that actually reflects back on oneself. Pati or pati passus, I suffer, I endure. And in my work on, on humanistic rubrics for medical school educations, I have found that both sensory and motor responses are crucial to educate and Hello? inform the medical students, the nursing students, and give them a toolkit of empathy and compassion, which immunizes them from burnout. Next slide, please, Ella. Right. Next slide. So the question here today for me to, to uh, address uh, is how do we take children young youngsters and give them the toolkits of empathy and compassion at the beginning of their lives, at the beginning of their cognitive lives. And how do we keep those, that flame of compassion and, and, and empathy burning in them throughout their lives? Next slide, please. And so I want to mention, uh, yes. next slide, Alain, uh, that I like to use a word, word clouds because word clouds yes. give so much power to the words that we use every day. And notice that for the words for empathy, connection, hearing, listening, communication, and compassion are also words that we see in the word cloud for compassion, which is listening and hearing and connecting uh, and addressing the fact we need that we are a community and not just isolated in our lives, which of course adheres to issues of bias and racism, which we'll get into, I'm sure, in our discussion session, section. Next slide, please. So uh, is compassion or our compassion and empathy nature or nurture or nature and nurture? Well, it's fascinating to know that there have been several studies that have been done that have looked at the fact that there is indeed a genetic component to compassion and empathy. But that's only about, and I don't want to use the word only, but that's about 10 percent, 12 percent of the totality. So genetics plays a role, but it's a small role, which means that nature and nurture are crucial. Uh, we can discuss more deeply the different types of empathy, cognitive empathy, affective empathy, emotional empathy, when we go to the discussion section. Next slide. And so uh, 
what are some of the examples? Next slide, Alain, please. Uh, as I mentioned, I like to consider and use sensory skills, listening, dialogues with facilitators, and getting in touch with feelings. And we can do this in children, with children. And I like to uh, adapt those and tie those into motor skills, which would be group activities and group challenges. To that end, uh, next slide. Uh, there are some very good examples already out there. For example, since 1993, uh, the Seeds of Peace Camp, which brings together 300 Arab and Israeli teenagers for a three-week camp in Otisville, Maine. Uh, this was a brilliant idea uh, to bring Arab and Israeli youth together for dialogues with facilitators, as well as group challenges, which are motor skills. So we have the sensory skills and the motor skills combined to teach empathy, compassion, community, tolerance, and removing bias and racism. Next slide, please. And so uh, music is an important part of my life. As a physician and surgeon, music has always been there in the operating rooms for me, classical music, and also in the clinical areas. I want to point out the brainchild of the brilliant maestro Daniel Barenboim and the brilliant Columbia University uh, uh, professor Edward Said. Uh, Daniel Barenboim is an Arg Argentinian-Israeli and Edward Said is Palestinian. They came together in 1999 to, to build the West East Von Orchestra, which brings young Palestinians, Israelis, and North African musicians together uh, to play music, to, to create music, to create community in sound. Last slide, please. And so what is the action plan? We need to validate compassion and empathy. We need to validate sensory uh, uh, skills, feelings, dialogue in, our, in children. We need to validate and include motor activities, especially in kids who are so energetic. Let's harness that motor activity. And we need to teach leadership skills, which actually come out of these sensory and motor uh, activities. And so if we can do that, final slide, we can go uh, to the stars, as Virgil said in the Aeneid, ad astra to the stars. Thank you. Uh, that's wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Vincent. Uh, the next speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Irene Poro. Uh, Irene, you are an astrophysicist with PhD in space science technology and technology. You worked as a research as a researcher at cutting edge centers of astrophysics, such as Harvard Smithsonian and uh, the Max Planck in Germany, MIT Space Research. Then you pivoted to focus on universal education for all uh, futuring STEM, science, technology, engineering, and, mathema and mathematics. Uh, applying arts and sciences to leave no one behind. What is the role of project-based learning and theater in science-based learning and the connection to human societal context, especially in the case of uh, systemic inequities. Thank you, Alain. Thank you for inviting me. So as you said, I'm a scientist and I am an educator. And for the past 20 years, I designed a wide range of initiatives for teenagers, all aimed at promoting science learning. So I'm not an early childhood educator, you know, but I do believe that what we learn from working with teenagers can inform uh, the strategies we implement with younger children. So, and also I'm a transdisciplinary educator. And in particular, I'm interested in helping youth developing problem-solving skills that include scientific concepts and competencies, but not just. So in my approach to problem solving, I, I propose that we need four ingredients. Competence, confidence, context, and compassion. Where the previous speaker has already introduced the term, and you know, I take compassion in, the, in its literal meaning of to suffer together and to feel motivated to act to relieve that suffering. So what I like to reflect here is a little bit about in the learning process that leads to problem solving skills that we can think in science and STEM, for example, doesn't start with developing competence, but starts rather with compassion and content. So one of the programs that we uh, have with our teenagers, you know, we first ask you to identify a problem and environmental justice issues 
issue in their communities and something they really care about. Then we introduce them in both skills and content as a, as a tool that empowers them to foster the change that they want to see in their community, in the world. So this is part of this project learning, project-based learning approach. The project starts with what the students and youth care about and are passionate about. So what is critical here is that we deliberately facilitate conversations and issues that require teenagers to engage in with topics uh, that are controversial or that address in general social injustice. Well, again, racist, social, systemic racism, for example, is one of our problems. What happens is that when the teens propose a problem that affects their community to the other teens, the other youth may feel empathy with them. However, it's not until they feel compassion for other human beings that they become motivated to act. And you collectively decide where to focus their action, and at that point, they start using evidence-based reasoning and learn more deeply about scientific information. So briefly, since you mentioned that, I'm also engaged in, I can talk more about that, in science theater performances that are both produced and performed by youth, for youth, and adults. Why theater? Theater is the environment that allows us to introduce science, what science in a human and societal context. And that's where it provides the opportunity for youth to develop that compassion that then leads to the pursuing deeper knowledge through scientific or in other things. So fundamentally, I think to answer your question in a bigger sense, I propose that we need to change our approach to learning and facilitate learning experiences where research focus on awakening the sense of compassion that is within uh, all of us in order to lead one to develop new competencies. So we shouldn't be afraid to propose real tough problems to encourage young people to find the sense of compassion because competence and confidence will follow. Thank you, Irene. Grazie. And uh, next is uh, Dr. Reyes Tamez Guerra. Uh, we are glad to have you, Reyes. You were challenged a little bit with the system, and uh, you were not the only one. We all face this kind of issues. You are also a scientist with the cutting edge knowledge and practice of immunology. You are a professor of medical sciences and former rector and minister of education in the first democratic government of Mexico in the late 20th century. And uh, today, guiding your counterparts across Latin America, with to ha your ha you have a vision to improve the quality of life and the economy of Latin Americans by tackling the root causes of inequities and uh, injustice. Reyes, we want to hear from you. Thank you so much, Alan. Could you hear me? Yes, yes very, very well. Thank you. Uh, education is a fundamental human right for all and part of our civic responsibilities. We need... Uh, therefore, Reyes, please, yes? please speak a little bit louder, just a little bit. Okay. Education is a fundamental human right for all and part of our civic responsibilities. And we need, therefore, to ensure universal, equitable access to quality results and less up to high school graduation. Major changes underlying the notion of learning in the way we conceive, develop and reach students are required for such education to be inclusive and intercultural at all levels and focusing on relevant knowledge acquisition, universal values and significance to the youth. This posits that educational management is a school decision with the core purpose to ensure coverage, prevent failure and dropouts, improve learning, and verify that all players and providers supporting the education system deliver effective services to schools. We must also recognize that each system area is unique, as are the educators, students, and families with whom they interact. For these reasons, 
it is necessary to to go hybrid, focusing on proximity development through education at the schools, uh, with considerably higher degree of autonomy to other specific local needs, while retaining accountability for universal topic development such as math and science at the national level. Education also requires competent, committed, conscientious, and courageous mission-driven teachers and consequential and immersed responsibility to calls for ongoing professional development for teachers. In Latin America, student learning remains at the levels found at the dawn of this century, resulting in a large difference in outcomes, reflecting as an illustration the inequalities experienced by indigenous children with live in rural areas and especially in small scattered towns and migrants who live in the, the private urban areas. Our vision is to ensure no doubts in Latin America prior to the age of 18 and to enable everyone with competency levels to participate with dignity, with dignity in a full adult life. We must also prepare those with the potential and the will to continue, not merely with the equal treatment based high school certification and demonstrated propensity to learn, but an equitable support to mitigate socioeconomic challenge that can deprive them for achieving the future they deserve. A success in this mission and vision will improve the quality of life and the economy of Latin American countries, reduce precarious and the uh, on management migration, those mitigating the hazards, the hazards facing the poor migrants, lives and elevating the underlying and persisting geopolitical tensions. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Reyes. It's the first time I see that uh, somebody is going to the roots of uh, uh, unmanageable migration and uh, the kind of rising geopolitical tensions that we have, we are witnessing. Yeah. Maybe we could start our debate from there. Uh, anyone would like to comment on uh, Reyes' vision for Latin America? Please don't hesitate. <laughs> Speakers? Anybody? <laughs> yes, uh, Nusa. Yeah, I just want to mention that um, I experienced uh, with the Mexican women, uh, we have been, both of us, in the International Socialist of Women, and uh, we were working on migration. She is from Zacatecas, and it's the border with the United States. And so I just want to c congratulate Reyes for his... Uh, Propose and it's very, very, uh, it's a huge issue. And I really understand. I was part of this committee, and it was a pleasure just to work on this issue. We have been um, priorit prioritizing uh, the dignity uh, because the flow of human uh, uh, circulation between countries uh, is just historical thing, and we should. Uh, not see as a security issue, but human issue. And, and education mm -hmm. issue, ultimately. Uh, Lack of inequity goes back to that. Thank yes, you so I much. Agree. I agree. The main problem in, in our countries is to, we, we have a very different uh, education. Uh, the, the quality of education is very different uh, in the regions. And uh, 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 the, the main problem is uh, we have uh, many dropouts b before 15 years old. More than 25% of the youth uh, uh, leave the schools. And uh, 
they they are uh, easy praise of the narco and the violence groups and and this is a main main, main problem we need to to improve our education systems and uh, uh, and reverse the inequalities on uh, education quality for all i think uh, uh reyes that focus on policy is very important what i like also about everyone presentation uh is there is a lot of overlap yeah. whether we deal with compassion empathy or policy yeah. or arts and sciences we can find sources of inspiration that can provide us with the synergy we need to achieve our respective missions uh you also and this may be the final comment about your presentation you also mentioned about uh, the need to decentralize or to bring part of the education curriculum yeah. locally so that local schools have and cities have some autonomy because from what i understand there are uh, young students who speak neither spanish nor uh, any international language and it would be good to consider teaching them at least at the beginning some of the basic skills in their own language but at the same time you want to maintain coherence and that's why you were talking about that hybrid system where you have differentiation to bring proximity to bear on the quality of education but integration to make sure there is a national curriculum at least in a, at least in the basic sciences like mathematics and and sciences and i think here uh, we have few educators uh irene nuzha and um Uh, Vincent, that's your profession, and uh, uh, Rachel, that's your love. So, what would you like to say about this concept of hybrid? We're seeing it now with the pandemic. I, I should have raised my hand. We're seeing it with the pandemic. It's okay. Go and ahead. I think that going going forward after the pandemic, and I fervently hope that there will be an after the pandemic, not just locally in areas in the United States, but all over the world globally in every country homogeneously i know that's a high bar but what we have noticed now is on the one hand zoom fatigue is driving us crazy in the sense that we're doing a lot of things virtually and we need the contact that we can only get by physically being in the same room with each other that tactility that tactile touch is huge even if we don't physically touch but being in the same space we're more present we're more apt to listen to truly mindfully center ourselves and listen and not be distracted that said i believe that hybrid education is the way to go i've seen it in my own family with nieces and nephews and what not and i also believe it strongly as an educator in in the medical school curriculum and in the ophthalmology curriculum specifically within medical school that on the one hand we need what we call heuristic skills that is skills that are experiential that's what heuristics means and we we can certainly do a lot of things in a hybrid virtual format that are more pedagogical learning these diseases learning these differential diagnoses these are the way that these present and of course ophthalmology being a visual science if we can show the diseases literally show most of our diseases photographically So I believe strongly that a hybrid model of virtual and live makes sense. I also want to speak to your point Ella and uh, Reyes about the issue of having to target this locally because I see that in medical school education. Medical schools we have 160 or so of them in the United States. They all have they're all fiefdoms if you will and of their on their own. They all have their own way of doing their pedagogy and their own way of teaching. So it's very hard to nationalize or scale nationally an educational curriculum i found that out heuristically by doing working on that over the last 10 years so i i believe that we can go virtual and live which is hybrid and i believe we have to teach locally and listen to our local educators as to how they see they want the pedagogy to go forward thank you and uh, rachel yeah go ahead irene go ahead oh I just want to reinforce this idea of the local perspective. I think I was emphasizing that in my example. I was focusing on local environmental 
to justice issues, but it could be any kind of local issues that make learning relevant. When we centralize learning, we are only focus on the final competencies that we're looking for, and we take all the meaning and the joy out of learning. When we engage local populations, wherever they are, not just the children, the whole population, on issues that they care about, we address uh, inequality, we address real issues, and most of all, we address this, this motivation issue that often we see, like in Rochelle, we have experience that when we teach math, for example, these people think, like, what should I learn this math? I, that has nothing to do with my life. Well, yes, it could have, but we haven't put the effort and, the, and honestly, the investment to really look at the local situation, the personal situation, and, and again, the community issues. That and it doesn't have always to be a problem, just really something that people care about and start from there and then go to the problem. Very, very interesting. And I think to, to build on that, Rochelle, uh, your focus on early education, and we had a chance to converse before even in preschool, before even going to school, and actually before preschool, uh, I mentioned about a family member who asked uh, everyone to propose a first name for her child, and then went on and picked up a name that no one thought of, Jackson. And we asked her, why Jackson? She said, it's the most common Afro-American name, and I want my son to realize that Afro-Americans are important in America. And then a few years, two, three years later, I brought him a teddy bear, and I was wondering if she would call him Nunus or something like what we do in France. And I asked her, what's his name? She said, Gonzalez. And I said, why Gonzalez? said, because we have Hispanic Americans. But... He had, I mentioned his revenge because Gonzalez was not complicated for three-year-old, so he ended up calling it S, but that's beside the point. Maybe you can comment on the importance of what happens in the family even before they go to, to school or preschool. Yeah. If you don't mind, I hear an echo. I'm not sure if it's because uh, Dr. DeLuise is not on mute, but that might uh, help. Um, so I want <laughs> Are you on to mute, uh, Vincent? I can, yeah, hi, can, I can, yes, I'm sorry if there's noise. I Paul, let me That's mute okay. myself. Thank you That's for telling okay. me and that. That's okay, I'm going to do if the I same. Can mute my, yes, I, okay. There you go. Go ahead. <laughs> so um, I just want to reiterate what Ms. Pearl was saying about uh, having a curriculum that's relevant to the population. When we talk about nationalizing, it's always, I mean, it's easier to do research on a national program. It's easier to measure. But one of the things that we're missing, especially with minority groups, um, Dr. Reyes talked about um, indigenous people, migrants. I would add to that uh, Afro-Mexicans. Um, one of the reasons we see them uh, leave school besides the economic piece is that it's not relevant to them. Instead of counting, I'm going to take the Canadian example because that's where I'm in Canada, instead of counting hockey sticks, um, some children are more comfortable counting man mangoes. It's something that they know what it is. They can, they've seen it. They've eaten it before. And that's an analogy for so many things that the way we teach math and scientists that's not relevant to the audience. And usually those who are excluded from that audience are minorities because usually the curriculum is, is created by the majority demographic. So that's, that's one thing that would address inequities. It, it would in address um, inequality in access. Um, and I'm not sure it would fix the, the disinformation piece, but it's something to really think about. Um, and when I think about the, your grandson's name, Jackson, and his teddy bear's name, that was a Latino name, I love that idea that the parents are purposely inserting diversity in their uh, everyday lives. And it goes to the point that I made at the beginning, is that it has to be a purposeful act um, because, and I'm going to quote Martin Luther King for one quick second. Uh, Martin Luther King said, change does not roll in on the wheels of inevit inevitability. And that just goes to doing things purposefully, intentionally to uh, level that playing field. Thank you. Perhaps we can uh, ask for questions from the audience. Please do not hesitate to raise your hand. 
from our audience. They're nicely listening. I can see that. I see Math or Hill or Mark Kemek. Anyone? Go ahead, uh, Dr. Kemek. Uh, I have to give him, I think I have to give him a microphone, yes. Here. Uh, go ahead. It's my fault, what am I doing? Uh, Matthew. Hi, it's actually Rebecca. Oh, <laughs> nice hello, Rebecca. <laughs> it's so nice to see you. It's nice to see you, too. And I really appreciated what um, all the speakers were talking about. I've been working at Ashbury College in art and English education. We try to incorporate STEAM, which is adding the art component. But I was wondering if um, you'd heard about the Valor Circles in Na uh, Nashville, Tennessee. It's a, an empathy circle that we've been using for the last two years every Friday morning, where a student it's a student-led facilitation where they can practice active listening uh, based on themes. And I was just wondering, it, it has seemingly helped us to develop empathy because we can talk about that in other areas of our classes. But I was wondering if you'd heard about these empathy circles that are now becoming more common in elementary and high schools. Anyone? Yeah. Can you comment about them, uh, Rebecca? Sure. They're, um, it's an initiative where they're psychology led. So they trained guidance counselors and psychologists and they gave yes. the training to the teachers. And then ultimately the goal was to have the students themselves, obviously in high school or the older grades leading the younger circles. And so um, we'll start off with just basic check-ins, you know, how are you feeling? One word check-ins, you're not allowed to pass um, your turn on that. Everyone sits in a circle so that there's that kind of diversity. And we have hand signals to develop empathy and active listening. So for example, um, like I feel you, something like I agree with you, uh, in order not to uh, to have them stop interrupting or laughing or commenting. And uh, the students will sort of take their turn. There'll be like a theme that they may talk about and they'll call someone forward to give kudos, which is a hugely beneficial um, thing that the, that the students will do for each other, uh, giving them, you know, thank you very much. And then not just for what happened, but then how it made me feel and then how that affected me. So that chain is really important in the empathy piece, not just thanks for being my friend at recess, thanks for passing me the ball, thanks for helping with my homework, but then the next part and the next part, which I think is uh, really helps their critical thinking about the impact of emotions. So anyway, their Valor Circles is the name of the school in Nashville, Tennessee. I highly, they've, there's a really great 10-minute uh, YouTube video that might be beneficial to check out. It's called Valor Circles. Yes, Valor. Wonderful. Yeah. Yes. Uh, How have you done it through with COVID? Well, um, MS Teams has been challenging. Um, I put the students in the uh, the auditorium, or sometimes there are different backgrounds to kind of give us that feeling that we're together, and. Normally, instead of being in a circle, when we're on those auditorium type settings, I'll say, okay, look to the person beside you. And I can literally go like this. So it looks like I'm looking at that person. Or sometimes we'll sort of point down to the next person. It just kind of creates that feeling. Sometimes they'll, um, they'll pat each other virtually on the back, that kind of idea. And uh, they take turns uh, that way by raising the hand signal and participating. So it does work in that setting, and the one, and because it's one at a time, uh, even when they're doing the hand signals, because everyone is muted, uh, it actually works very, very well, <laughs> because we don't get the outbursts of, of laughter and that sort of thing. It's it's interesting because there are uh, groups and universities that are work precisely working in that area uh, of a sign language for virtual communities that would be pertinent to children as well as. Uh, adults in different cultural contexts. Irene, you had a question or a comment. Well, actually, I wanted to, to comment that indeed I've been using opening and closing circles for many years with teenagers, again, you know, and, and, and it's a very powerful experience. And again, uh, I think for the educators in the room is to be prepared, we introduce strategies to support the students, of course. But in reality, it's without 
us, it helps us become a better listener and to really understand reality that we, we think we know about and we often have to really sitting there. I've done it, you know, for entire summers, but at the end I have a completely different understanding of the life and the reality that my students uh, were experiencing and made me a better educator. But I wanted to add very briefly, and I'm happy sure. to be a resource if people are interested. There are all, there is a, not completely new, but emerging field uh, that is uh, intersecting social emotional learning and social emotional development, that of course has been existing for a long time, but with STEM learning, STEM STEAM, so the, because there are many areas of intersections that can be really powerful, and specifically because in STEM we often thought that, oh, emotions and, and other issues don't get into the realm of STEM learning. Uh-uh, wrong. So there is a lot of research and our diversity at the intersection of social emotional learning and STEM. I would encourage everyone to check it. There, there are literally ground zero of STEM learning. So, uh, unfortunately, we only have four more minutes. We can, uh, the recording will stop, but for the benefit of Horasis and other viewers in the future on YouTube, we're going to do one round of maybe 30 seconds to 40 seconds conclusions, and then we can continue our dialogue for a few minutes after that because they will turn off the recording. Okay, so let's start in the reverse sequence. Uh, Reyes? Oh. Would you like to add a few words? Yes. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think all the topics are very relevant for the improve our uh, countries. And uh, uh, thank you so, so much for the invitation. It's a, it's a very you're, nice. You're to, more than welcome, uh, Reyes. And uh, everyone, I'm sure, will be delighted to continue this dialogue with you. Uh, yeah. Irene? Yeah. I think I would like just to, to close with, you know, we've been asking if children can lo learn to avoid biases or learn to dismantle inequity and justice or they can learn in an environment where they can fail. I don't think that's the right question. The answer, the short answer is yes, they can. I think what we should really ask is why are, are we not providing the learning environment mm -hmm. where children of any age can learn to practice compassion, can understand how to fight inequality, can support the common good. Instead, that we always push them to, honestly, this detrimental idea of self-promoting and being first at all costs. So I think let's focus on the why more on that. If. That's a great question. And Vincent? Uh, uh, we can't hear you, Vincent. Turn on your microphone. You. I keep forgetting to go on and off. Thank That's you. I'm okay. back on. Uh, I just want to reiterate what I said earlier. And first of all, uh, I was really privileged to be invited to this esteemed panel. So thank you so much, Alain, and other panelists for allowing me to uh, be part of this wonderful 45-minute panel, panel discussion. I, I just want to reiterate the concept that children have such incredible energy and potential. And to harness that energy and potential, we need to uh, work with them. We need to work with both their sensory skills and even by the age of two, they're already extremely intuitive, extremely receptive to learning and thinking and feeling. I see it with my own granddaughter and I want and I think we should uh, act on that, act on their feelings and their sensitivity and harness that with motor activities. Let's channel their energy, their physical energy, their potential energy. Into, into positive kinetic energy with group challenges, group activities, which really then subconsciously bind them together as a community without regard to gender or race. Thank you very much, uh, Vincent. Uh, the next is uh, uh, Rachel. <laughs> Uh, thank you. I'm going to say thank you for having me in this esteemed panel also. Uh, I want to conclude by reminding all of us that we're in an increasingly more globalized world. In fact, uh, this is a global meeting and the globe includes people of every gender, race, class and everything in between. And in order for us to become a more uh, a freer and more united people. 
we're going to have to tackle this. And you know that it starts with the children. We've heard this a million times before, but not just starting with the children, but making it a purposeful act that the children are in your lives, you can make a difference. So that's my message to everybody listening today. Okay, we are uh, almost out of time, but I just want to mention uh, in closing that uh, typically policymakers tend to be dealing mostly with the issue of the day, like today, cyber terrorism. And they must. But the issue of inequity was not most pressing issue in many countries until another surprise event or an incident that shakes deeply held belief, in this case, George Floyd. How can we help policymakers to address systemic inequities as an integral part of their day-to-day mission rather than as, a sur- as something in response to a surprise event? And I want to leave this thinking with us. Hopefully we can uh, continue the dialogue for just for a few minutes because it's now uh, 2.16. Probably we are out of the uh, Horace's central uh, recording, but let's continue. I have Mark Kemek. Dr. Kemek has a question. The microphone is yours, Mark. Mark? Uh, he... Hello, Mark, from Montreal. Uh, I think you have a connection issue, no? Go ahead, Mark. He said, okay, I got it. Ah, our uh, session can continue as long as you want, but the time has elapsed, it says. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, we lost Mark. So anybody would like to comment on the fact that we have to move policymakers from being event-driven to mission-driven and how, what can we do to move in that direction? Est-ce que je peux prendre la parole, Alain? Yes, sir. Oui, oui, absolument. Comme tu m'as pas donné la parole à la fin, comme ah, chacun... Ah, I'm sorry, I forgot you. Yes, of course, I forgot okay. you. It's not intentional. Go ahead. So, uh, allow me to go back uh, to our initial panel, yes. just to to uh, make two comments. Uh, I want to underline the important... Um, uh, Dr. Vincent, Vincent um, underline the importance of uh, the presence, physically presence, the, the energy, how we can meet and share. And uh, I would like to uh, go in the same way. But I would like also to say that the COVID-19 offered uh, to us an opportunity of the e-learning, which can, for us in Morocco, democratize more uh, the education. For those forgotten, for example, in rural areas, for disabilities, pe- people with disabilities. So I think that for us, it's an opportunity to reaffirm our mission in order uh, to offer an equal and uh, uh, an equal e- education, but of quality for all of uh, for all. This is the first point. Uh, the, the second point uh, I was uh, I wanted to to share. Uh, it's uh, also uh, about what uh, Dr. Vincent said. Uh, I witnessed it. Um, we had opportunity to gather Palestinian, Israeli, and other communities together through music. And I believe that education through music, through arts, can make us closer. And we need uh, this education based on tolerance, education for peace. So thank you, Vincent, for uh, raising this question. Thank you, Nusha. And I'm very, very sorry. It was never intentional. You know us. We know each other for many years. Uh, And uh, I think the um, concept of uh, bringing arts like music and fine arts to beer, because uh, as Vincent Uh, can comment, they are part of the brains, especially in creativity, that yes. can actually be advanced or, or improved thanks to the practice of fine arts and, and music. Correct, Vincent? 
Uh, absolutely. And I believe that the comment that was made about going from STEM to STEAM is crucial because STEM is, an, STEM is very important, science, technology, engineering, and math, but we need to include the arts. Uh, I believe strongly in the holistic concept of the brain. I do believe that we do have right and left brain differences. That's been proven by functional MRI testing. Not only do we have gender differences in brain cortical structure and therefore implicitly potentially function, we also have right and left brain uh, differences in terms of quantitative things and qualitative things. Even, for example, the appreciation of music. The appreciation of music is bihemispheric, but it's actually asymmetric. Pitch and harmony are mostly in the right hemisphere, whereas meter and tempo are in the left hemisphere, being more mathematical, for example. And most of us, whether we're lefties or righties, are left dominant, 97% of us. So without getting too lost in the weeds in neurology this afternoon, I do want to point out that it's crucial to bring in the arts, as has been mentioned, uh, into any educational process because it really works so um, effortlessly. We teach children how to play a musical instrument. They then are in a community of learners, regardless of gender, race, color of their skin, philosophy, religion, or faith. They're in a room playing an instrument, whether it's a Suzuki violin or a, an electric piano or percussion, which is actually a very good way to start children in terms of meter and rhythm. Uh, I've seen that with my own eyes. It works. It works to break down barriers instantaneously and get to what's fun. And fun leads to community and community leads to reduction in bias and reduction in, in, in uh, inequality, in my view. So thank you for letting me expound on those things for a moment. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, if there are any further comments, please do not hesitate. The streaming is still going on for YouTube. Uh, if not, we will, because I know you have other priorities. And please, uh, anybody would like to add a comment? Well, uh, I just want to say that I agree yes. with the Dr. DeLuise. Uh, my own child um, is in one of those orchestras for kids that are newcomers. And even though they do it virtually, unfortunately, he's learning the recorder, the flute. Um, you can see how um, all these children that are from different backgrounds, many of them are new to Canada. Um, language are, barriers are very present. They start on the same level playing field. Uh, with music. So I look forward to the post-COVID era when all children can physically be together. That'll be even better to foster the ideas that we're trying to talk about today. Well, when uh, I undertook this uh, small mission, uh, I proposed to Frank, we will address the issue of inequities, disinformation, etc. And typically, I get uh, proposals for speakers, and in this case, I said, I will get you a dream team. So thank you so much for a dream team, and let's continue together. All the very thank best. Au revoir, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah.